think it's possible. But do you not think that one of the problems is that the opposition continues to fight on terms that have been set by Prime Minister Modi? And when they do come up with their own narratives, those narratives are often so complex and dense and technical. So if you had Rafal in 2019, you have Adani in 2024. Uh, and, and, and you know, if you had Chokidar Chorhe in 2019, you now have Panauti used for Modi by Rahul Gandhi, even when the prime minister goes to visit the cricket team in, in the dressing room. Now, I'm not saying that Modi has not used similarly personal comments for the Gandhis. He has, but the spoils belong to the victor. And at the moment, the opposition is very clearly reacting to Modi's politics instead of forging a, sort of a direction of their own. But that's inevitable. When you have a very strong prime minister, anything you do is always framed in terms of that prime minister. When Mrs. Gandhi was prime minister, all opposition politics was framed in terms of getting rid of Mrs. Gandhi. Hence her famous construction, It's not so dissimilar what's happening. Indira Gandhi lost ultimately not because of the Janta Party or these guys who got together for a few months before fighting and breaking up again. She lost because of her own mistakes. She lost because of an economic crisis which led to a student's movement, a court judgment which led to a judge, which led to an emergency, a sterilization campaign done by a thug like younger son. She lost because of her own mistakes, not because of anything the opposition did. So the only person who can defeat Narendra Modi, given today's scenario, is Narendra Modi. So far, he's avoided any mistake. And those mistakes that he has made, I think, demonetization must count as one of them. The complete mishandling of the pandemic, which you've written a book about, must count as another one. He's managed to survive. So he is the great Teflon prime minister and those parallels with Indira Gandhi are persistent in a way. Oh, he's very much. He's very much the Indira Gandhi of his times. But he has an advantage over Indira Gandhi, with a couple of advantages. One advantage certainly is that he has no family. He has no children. There's no Sanjay Gandhi to come along and create problems. And the other advantage is that, unlike Mrs. Gandhi, who cared what people wrote about her and therefore moderated her behavior, he cares about what people wrote about him only to the extent that he shuts him up. You, it's such an interesting thing you spoke about him being an advantage that he has no children. You know, in, in travels across India during elections, the one thing that people say again and again is that they believe Modi is not corrupt because he doesn't have any children to leave anything to. And right. it's very it's very different from the American way where the sort of picket fed suburban family portrait is what you need uh, to actually be a success in, uh, in, in, in politics. But, you know, when I was listening to you, I was thinking, is there a parallel? Like when you think of a Tony Blair, for example, who, who wanted to create a new labor. And today you, you look at Stramer trying to do the same. So taking therefore not a leftist position uh, on Israel. Is there a need now for a new Congress in the, you know, that you have to fashion a party that still speaks to the center of this country and that the party, party or parties taking on Modi have just lurched too far to the left? I don't know if it's even the left. I don't think Mr. Modi's success is because he's right-wing or whatever. I think you can say Hindutva is certainly a component of it, but I think his success now goes far beyond Hindutva. Mr. Modi has now got to the situation where very few politicians have before, in that most people who vote now see him as being above politics. He's not even seen as a politician. There was a time when he grew his beard long and went and meditated in... Uh, caves, etc. He's almost set himself up for much of India, not the sort of educated elite that watches our discussions, as being a sort of guru-like figure, the Vishwa Guru point. He set himself up as being some kind of above politics, who has no family, who has no life. He cares only about India, and he will do what it takes if it, because he has to take India forward. It's not an image that the English-speaking elite necessarily buys. Well, I think many English-speaking elite people do buy it. Right? It's not an image that people who watch your show and my show buy. But I think that is the success of Mr. Modi, that he's created this persona for himself and he has successfully sold it to the country. The other very perceptive point that you have made is that for most people, what is a democracy? A democracy is that you can exercise your right to vote and you can either bring in governments or make governments fall. And most Indians, I think if most Indians were surveyed, they would believe that democracy in India is healthy, elections are free and fair. 
आफ्टर ऑल इवन मोदी इज नॉट इनविंसिबल लुक हमने बीजेपी को भी हरवाया है यू नो एट द स्टेट लेवल एट लीस्ट एंड इंस्टीट्यूशन ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी पीपल केयर अ लॉट लेस अबाउट एंड देर फॉर ऑल ऑफ दीज डिबेट्स अराउंड मीडिया कोर्ट्स ED, EC, these are rarefied. These are concerns of a very minuscule minority. That's a that's a very perceptive point made by you. So speak a little more to that. Well, all democracies function because of the institutions of democracy. They function because they have liberal values. The term in the West for most successful democracies is liberal democracy because the liberal value is. A, an essential component of democracy because otherwise at its most extreme democracy can have 51% of the population murdering the other 49% right you have to have guarantees for minority rights you have to have justice you have to have legal institutions that work you have to have a free press that allows dissenting opinions to come out these are things that indians have never really understood we now romanticize the emergency but during the emergency mrs gandhi destroyed the institutions of democracy she done how a pretty good job how do we romanticize the emergency we say the people of india got up and said we are ah. in favor of democracy go away that's not really we romanticize the removal of emergency i should say that's what happened they lost in the hindi belt because of sterilization otherwise i i was around during the democracy i met people and there was a lot of this an era of discipline and what mrs gandhi has done is good people are working the trains run on time black marketers are all going to jail etc so there is a streak in indians that wants a benevolent dictator but a dictator they can get rid of at elections they don't really care about institutions and you can argue if you were cynical that institutions themselves have done very little to endear themselves to indians do you expect indians to respect the courts when justice is unavailable to the common man he can't afford it and if he does go to court it'll take him 20 years to get any kind of judgment do you expect him to respect the police force and say the police and the agencies must be left independent when the police are corrupt and randomly beat him up on at will without anyone saying anything so yes the institution of democracy in india have also done very little to endear themselves to indians and yet without those institutions democracy can't function but mr modi i think has clearly realized that as long as he is in election mode as long as he gives people the view that they can vote him out that he's appealing directly to them he's okay they won't pay many attention much attention to the institutions and that's what's happened finally you've you know you've observed written about reported on politics for decades india has gone through a phase the indira phase or a one party domination phase for many decades we're clearly in the in the bjp phase you said the one difference is that or advantage that modi has over india is he, indira is that he doesn't have children is there yeah. anything else about this phase that feels different or does it feel familiar in many ways that many of the debates we have today have taken place before i mean i was reading manu bhagwan's book on vijayalakshmi pandey and she is saying back then that oh the congress is you know close to fresh ideas is close to fresh blood she is arguing with indira during the emergency years so i mean in the life of a country many arguments are cyclical i have lost you if you can hear me okay i i i was just i was just saying in the life of a country many of these arguments have taken place before and i was talking about how manu bhagwan's book on vijayalakshmi pandit actually talks about vijayalakshmi pandit saying back then that oh the congress is closing its doors to fresh ideas to fresh blood yeah, you know dissent is being uh, uh, sort of crushed so i'm i'm just saying a, in the life of a country we've heard some, some of these arguments before but is there something about today that feels different from those moments well i can only quote arun shori who said that today's bjp is congress plus cow we've not had that before we've not had political debates about religion to the extent we have them now we've not had people bulldozing the homes of muslims at will without any legal sanction never before in indian politics has the center had debates that have been framed so strongly in terms of religion and in terms of majority and minority that's what feels different and you don't think that's going to change with the third term i see no reason for him to change why should he change what there is a legacy that any prime minister would seek for himself or herself what might that legacy be you imagine for mr modi 
I'll tell you how Mr. Modi sees it. Mr. Modi sees it as he is the prime minister who took India forward, who helped India become a technological superpower, who delivered prosperity to Indians, that to much of the middle classes, he delivered proper economic prosperity to people who couldn't partake of it. He did welfare schemes and he gave them prosperity, which but you frankly can't deny. He will argue that he resumed non-alignment, which had been dead since the Nehru days, that during the Ukraine conflict, he could continue to do business with Russia and be friends with America. That even now, in the Israel conflict, he's great friends with Netanyahu and with Israel, yet he's not fallen out with a single Arab country. So he will argue in foreign policy terms, he gave India a presence on the world stage and a position that it had not had since the early days of non-alignment. Isn't the Arab outreach in particular fascinating? I mean, there is going yeah. to be an inauguration of a big temple in Abu Dhabi in the same month. And yeah. the point is that you have Muslim leaders of the Arab world who seem to genuinely, not only for transactional reasons, have a pretty decent rapport with the prime minister. Yeah, I think you, the thing you've got to learn about the Arab world, and we've seen this all the time, is that when it comes to Muslims elsewhere, it's not necessarily that concern. I mean, if you remember when Yugoslavia broke up and you had the Bosnian conflict, I didn't see very, very many people calling for jihad on behalf of the Muslims who were affected by that, and many Muslims were affected by that. Even now, when you see the complaints that many Muslims have about how they're being treated in India, it doesn't cut any eyes with the Muslim world. They're very happy with Mr. Modi. They're happy to be friends with India. They're happy to venerate and celebrate Mr. Modi. If you go the other extreme on Islam, if you say anything about the Prophet as one BJP spokesperson did, then yes, of course, they get upset. But Indian Muslims, are, they couldn't care less. And what, what might that mean for the political options of Indian Muslims? Well, for, for, for a start, what about the objections or the options of the Hindus? For a long time, Hindus have been fed this idea that Muslims have a pan-national identity, pan-national loyalists, that there is a global Islam that will envelop us. There is no global Islam. You can do what you like to Muslims in this country and no Muslim country is going to no Muslim country abroad is going to come to their aid. They will treat this as India's internal matter. I think we have to realize that. But that's that right too, right? That's correct too. I mean, from an Indian yeah, perspective, but, but that's not, I, I, that's I don't think we'd be thrilled no, at I, I have no problem the Americans lecturing us. Sure, yeah. but that's not been the BJP's point of view. No? The BJP's point of view has always been that Indian Muslims are loyal to some greater Islamic entity outside of India, perhaps to Pakistan. Else. And all the evidence has been against it. We had the smallest number of people joining Al-Qaeda, ISIS, whatever. Indian Muslims have seen themselves as being Indian, have always been patriotic, have never looked outside of India for any kind of support, which is probably just as well, because they're not going to get it. Okay, last question. One of the things I think it bears underlining is that there was this idea of the BJP as a Brahminical party. But data yeah. shows you, if you look at the data of the recent assembly elections in the Hindi-speaking uh, states, not in Telangana, that an increasing number of Dalits, of scheduled tribes, uh, are actually voting for the BJP. This is something very interesting that is actually uh, happening, and it's happened in the previous Lok Sabha elections as well. And it tells you what you've been saying throughout this conversation, that there isn't any one reason that you yeah. can isolate and say, this is why Modi wins. So I'm going to end by asking you, if you had to say, apart from Hindutva, because Hindutva is the obvious one as one factor, apart from Hindutva, what are three, three reasons or five reasons that Modi keeps winning elections? What would you say they are? Well, there's one key reason, that is his own personal popularity and his charisma. Whatever other people say, people who don't like him say, and yes, he is a polarizing figure, there is no doubt that there are many Indians who venerate him, who love him, who wouldn't necessarily vote for the BJP, but will vote for Modi. These victories are Modi's personal victories. We try and underplay that. For instance, when the BJP won the UP election, everybody said, oh, Yogi sprung a surprise. It was not Yogi. It was Modi. It's that same pattern that's been repeated in state after state. I think that is the single greatest reason for the BJP's success today. 
just as Mrs. Gandhi split the Congress in 1969, and people said she's an outlier, and the Congress, which kept the opposite, kept the organization and the money, campaigned against her and lost, because ultimately people preferred Indira Gandhi to the Congress as it then existed. In the case of the BJP, there's no question of the BJP splitting the party, but there is no doubt that Modi is much, much bigger than the BJP. I think that's the main reason why it does well. The second reason is, of course, that there are no economic crises. Yes, you can quote me figures to say that unemployment has gone up, that our rate of growth has slowed down, etc. But people are not unhappy with this enough to vote against the government. They believe, for better or for worse, and I think surveys will show you that, that things will get better in India. There is optimism about the future. And at a time of optimism, you don't rock the boat. leader who you like, and things seem to be going well you don't see any reason to look for somebody else. I mean, I think Pratap Bhanu Mehta said in, in an Indian Express column that the opposition has no ideas for the aspirational Indian. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard this a lot. I don't think that's the point. I think Rahul Gandhi actually is saying a lot for the aspirational Indian. But when we talk about the Indian, we essentially focus on a certain class. There are a lot of people who were raised from being in the working class or the very edges of the middle class to being a new middle class by the reforms of 1991. These were in many ways Manmohan Singh's children. The irony is that all of them vote for Modi because they see him also as being a success like them. They hate the old English-speaking elite who they think they're now rep replacing. And the Congress they see as being part of that old order. Well, Veer, I could go on, but, uh, you know, I have to let you go. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as the Chinese would say, we live in interesting times, but they're not too many That's surprises. A curse. That's a curse in China. That's a curse I didn't mean, I didn't mean no, it in that. Say, yeah. I, I quickly desified it like the, what is it? The alu tiki burger at McDonald's yeah. uh, applied okay. in our own context uh, firmly. But it, like, I, I, it's going to be interesting. A week is a long time in politics, but at least as far as one can forecast, there don't seem to be any big surprises left in this election, even though we're still a good five months away from it. Uh, but thank you. It's been a fascinating conversation as always. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.